The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 55. Our Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field of strength conditioning to talk shop. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join our mailing list at RonMcKeefrey.com so that you can stay up to date with the latest episodes and anything else we got going on. This week, I'm very excited to have Donnie Mabe with us. Donnie is one of the all-time great guys, just a freaking unbelievably humble guy, but, um, but has had so much success. Uh, he is the head strength coach for the Olympic sports at the uh, University of Texas. He's been around, had some great mentors. We get into that a little bit. We talk about you know how he's been able to um, set up a, a, a great structure uh, at the University of Texas, as well as managing and, and motivating uh, a phenomenal staff. You know, they got a couple master strength coaches on their staff, as well as some people that have been in the field for a long time. And uh, we talk a little bit about that. We also talk about his internship program, some of the things they're doing there, which, which I think are pretty unique. Uh, he spoke at the CSCCA conference, and so I wanted to have him on the show to talk a little bit more about that. Before we get started, I want to make sure we recognize our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com. Ignition is a sports performance company based in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, I got a chance to get to know them quite a bit while I was in Cincinnati, but you know, Cliff Marshall and and the rest of the gang there are some top-notch guys that are doing it the right way. I would encourage you, if you have not you know, gone to their Facebook page or any of their social media, stay up with what they got going on. I mean, they just recently featured in the Athletes in Action magazine. And so it really gives you a, a glimpse into who they are as a company and, and what their values and their, their beliefs are. And, you know, I want to encourage you to go to their website and register uh, if you can make it for their speed certification course in Naples. It, it, I, I took this last year. I thought they did a fantastic job with it. And uh, there just isn't a whole lot of speed certifications out there. And so having that on your resume and being able to promote yourself uh, as a speed certified strength coach is uh, a unique selling proposition. You know, I always talk to our interns about having unique selling propositions on their resume. So I think this is something that would be great. They have one in July. Uh, the first and second down in Naples, but they do things on demand for staffs as well. Uh, they recently just got back from Auburn where they put on an in-service with them and were able to certify their staff while they're there. So I'd encourage you to do that. Lastly, if you enjoy these episodes, you will definitely enjoy strength-ondemand.com. Strength on Demand is a online archive of strength and conditioning clinic presentations that myself and Rob Taylor uh, put together and you know, we're re- right now we're, we're taking a little bit of different approach to this than what we had originally planned to do. We, we originally planned to uh, add, uh, you know, 52 presentations each year. But what we're going to start doing is just dumping presentations as we, uh, as clinic presentations as we get them. And uh, from there, just increase the price as we uh, get several in the bank. So I would encourage you right now, it's $97. I'd encourage you to join now because a year from now, it may be several hundred uh, clinic presentations that you've got uh, for only $97. So it's a clinic in your pocket. It's on demand. It's when you're able to do it. And uh, as strength coaches, we know that time is our most precious resource. All right. I want to get to Donnie. I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. He's Like I said, he's a fantastic person. And um, you know, I want to share uh, with with you guys. Uh, our conversation. So sit back and enjoy. All right, guys, real excited to have a good buddy, uh, Donnie Mabe, with us today. Donnie's the head strength coach for the Olympic sports at the University of Texas, and he's just an all-around great guy, one of the one of the 
you know, one of the leaders in our profession and doing some fantastic things down at Texas. So, man, I uh, appreciate you finally getting on here. Thank you, Coach Mac. It's a pleasure and honor to be on today. Thank you. Donnie, you know, um, you know, you've been in this field for a long time. A lot of people know about you, but, you know, for the guys that don't know your journey, how you kind of got into the field and, and, and how you ended up being at Texas for as many years as you've been there, go into that, that journey, you know, just the, the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, I, I started out, I, I was playing football at the University of Georgia from 88 to 92 and had a real bad injury my, going into my senior year in the spring game. Blew my ACL, was devastated. I didn't know what I was going to do. Like most probably athlete, you know, football athletes, you, you want to go pro. That's your ultimate dream. Sure. So the realization that that wasn't going to work out was, was hit me hard. And I didn't really, I didn't focus on school as much then. I didn't have a great GPA because I was so planning on going pro and, and getting a shot doing that. And so I was faced with this, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I always have loved the weight room from high school all the way up through college. We Coach, we would work out like three times a day in the summer. We'd do agilities in the morning. We would lift in the afternoon and do some more work in, in the evening. So I love the weight room. And one summer, I trained with Doc Crease at Middle Tennessee State University my junior season. And he made a statement that summer. He said, Donnie, if you ever want to get into this field, I'll help you. And I was like, oh, yeah, whatever, coach. And, <laughs> and so that kind of that came back to me when I blew my knee. And, and so I called him up and, and, and started out as an intern in 1994, which, which was pretty cool because it was really Doc and one assistant, Dave Pleddle. And then I was the only intern. So back then, I had my own team. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know, you can't work and coach, man. They threw me in the grease, coach, and, and it was hot, too. <laughs> and so that's how I got my start there. So I worked with all teams as an intern, and it really it really stretched me fast. And from 94 to 97, I worked with football, basketball, you name it. And we also had kind of a cool thing there, too. We would have other coaches come in at the time. There was a certification called ISSA. Yeah. International Sports Science Association. So guys like Fred Hatfield and Charles Staley would come in. I would be the guy that had to pick them up at the airport. Oh, that's awesome. And so I would get to ask them these neat questions. So that kind of got me going as well. Then for, in 1998, uh, Coach Madden called and offered me a position at Texas as kind of the bottom rung on the, on the totem pole. So I came to Texas to work with football and Coach Brown. And then I picked up a couple Olympic sports because I always – carried those when I was at Colorado. So I wanted to, I like training other sports. And then from 98 till 2007, I worked my way up the totem pole under Coach Madden as the top assistant for football. And then in 2010, 2011, I made a transition. They created a, a division in our department where we had Olympic sports. They were going to build a brand new weight room and football would be separate in the departments. And they offered me the, the head strength coach for Olympic sports and I accepted it. And I've been in that position now three years. Well, that's fantastic. You know, and I, you touched on a lot of important steps there. Like you and I both believe in the, the, the you know, the, the importance of having a mentor. Uh, you've had several. The importance of being exposed to a lot of different ways and things, you know, coaches and the ways they do things. Those are so important in the growth of, of, of our profession and, and as coaches. And um, you had some great mentors and leaders in that group, though, that's for sure. You know, you mentioned um, Texas, you know, has made this, this shift now where they've kind of separated things out in terms of, you know, maybe a football strain staff, you know, Olympic strain staff. I don't know where basketball kind of falls in that. T talking a little bit about how um, there's, there's maybe a division now, you know, and allocation of resources, but then how do you guys work har harmoniously with each other and, and, and benefit from each other? Yes, sir. The the big thing, you know, you're, you kind of see two models across the country. You see a football kind of director. He runs the whole department. And then you see a football by itself and then another, like, a director of the department kind of separate over the Olympic sports. That's your two models. There are some variations in that, but that's the model you see. And so what happened was, as football was, was going along, they definitely saw a need. I think football saw the need that they wanted to have their own facility. I think that you see with your, your bigger schools that are competing for that BCS championship, they have their own facility. Whereas at Texas, for years, we all use the same weight room for mm -hmm. the most part. And so 
I think it was four or five years ago, they redid the north end zone at the, at the football stadium. If you ever come down, you'll see it. It's, it's amazing. And so within that, they created a space for a brand new Olympic weight room, which was cool. And I had no idea it was coming, coach. I was just kind of working and, and trying to get myself ready for different opportunities. And this, you really, it just came out of nowhere. And I happened to be ready when the cards kind of fell in line. So that's kind of what happened in Texas. So they split the department where you have a head football strength coach over football now. Then myself, I'm over the Olympic sports. And then basketball is separate as well. So Todd Wright oversees basketball mm -hmm. for that side. And we all, you know, Coach Moore just got here from University of Louisville. So I'm getting to know him. And he's been phenomenal as far as helping me with different things. And then Todd, we've been, Todd got here about the same time we did. And he's, if you ever met Coach Wright, he's so humble down to earth and so willing to help us in any way. So we all get along great in our departments, and it's really, it's fortunate. We're fortunate. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, and, and again, it's, it's, you're right, there's, there's a, a couple different paths that we're being faced with right now in terms of are we separating out and getting more sport individualized? Are we going to be more the high-performance model? Um, so it's interesting to see how you guys are doing things down there. You know, with that comes, um, obviously, running a department, having great members of your staff, and, and, and I know you particularly, um, you have some great ones down there as, as assistant strength coaches for you. You know, you got a master strength coach in, in Sandy, and you got Trey, and I think Trey's either master or close to being a master at this point. Yeah, he's real close, yeah. Um, you know, went to Ottawa, Ottawa grad, so I'm, I'm fired yes, up sir. about that. You know, he's a stud. That just means he's a stud. That's right, but, Coach. Um, right. But you talk a little bit about how you guys have formed this great relationship, how you're able to, to feed off one another, but as well as um, you as the leader motivate uh, very quality and, and motivated strength coaches. Yeah, that's that's good. I, I think when this all happened, Coach, one of the big things was – you know, I, Sandy came to me as soon as the position was created. And she's like, I'd be interested in being an assistant director, in which, you know, Sandy and I have worked together for years and have really good respect for each other, and we trust each other. That's two huge things because we've been in the trenches together. Yep. And uh, But Sandy was – she had kind of hit a ceiling in her career where she needed a change. And so I was pumped. And, and so I worked with HR on – really reinventing her role and changing her title from her job description to her day-to-day -day responsibilities and said, Sandy, give me a little time to work on this and let's see if we can get it done. I think we can and then let's go from there. And Coach, you know this, you've coached long enough. You're only as good as those you have around you. Yeah. You're not going to be any greater. And I think that one of the the leadership laws I love to kind of live my life by is called the law of attraction. And that states that you don't attract what you want, you attract who you are. And I knew that this was a big undertaking to be a director. I'd never been a head strength coach before. And so I was kind of getting out some deep water where I couldn't swim. And so I knew I had to have some key people on board, and Sandy was one of them. She's very respected in our field. She knows what she's doing. She's very detail-oriented, which I'm not the most detail-oriented person, which I don't know if most history and coaches are. So you need people that can kind of balance out your weaknesses. Sure. Just don't always hire and put people on your staff that's exactly like you. And so she was a huge asset. And then right after that, you, you talked about Trey. Getting Trey on board was huge, too. Getting him back, getting him changing his role. And, and, and we, we changed both their titles. They're both assistant head coaches over Olympic sports. We both gave them managerial duties to help them grow and, and, and groom themselves. So if they want to branch out and be directors at some point, they'll have that experience. So it was a huge piece of the puzzle, Coach. No doubt. You, going a little bit further with the, you know, the, that HR process, okay? So, you know, and, and this is something that's commonly faced. You know, you, you're, you're in a role where you're the head strength coach, you got an assistant strength coach, an assistant strength coach, and maybe a couple GAs. And to motivate that coach, you, you know, the title, the title piece is big. So, you know, w when you went to HR, you went to your athletic director, how did that conversation go? What were some of the steps that you took to say, Hey, look, we want to, this is not just an assistant strength coach anymore. We, we want to give this person some, some real responsibility and some, and, and, and then turn around and compensate them accordingly. Yeah. The biggest mistake I made coach was when I went into HR, 
I went in there kind of with my, my flag in the ground and, hey, these coaches have been here a long time. They yeah. deserve, you know, raises. They deserve to be promoted. That's not what, that is not the, the drum you want to beat, they told me. If you want to have success in kind of getting what they call like a reorganization of your staff, is you've got to, you've got to create the responsibilities and, and, and justify and convince them of the need that you have in your department to help the student athletes. And so that was the change in kind of the view of how we would attack it. And it was, it was huge. And I don't know how other schools are, but if you doing the internship program over the years, I've gotten to know our HR staff really well because of all the paperwork we've had to do. So coach, that was a bonus when I started going in there to fight for our staff. I already had trust and they knew, believed in what I was doing as a, as a coach. So that when I laid out these parameters, they helped me. They got the number one. They helped me with the proper verbiage. That's huge because when you go to meet with an administrator, you can't talk in coach language. Right. You got to talk in their language. So they helped me with the verbiage and laid it out like that. And it was, it was pretty much a slam dunk. I was really expecting them to tell me no, but they were all on board. Especially uh, Chris Polanski was amazing in helping us get all that done. And, and I can't thank her enough. So. That's, uh, you know, so, you know, something that I follow up, this is, you know, this is more of a question for me then is, you know, in, in those roles, in those assistant roles, you know, a lot of times they're doing all those things. They're just not being compensated accordingly. You know, they're, they're, be, they're being the internship coordinator. They're, you know, they're, they're helping with, you know, with the, um, on hiring committees and all these different things. You know, how were you able to take what they were already doing and separate that out and say, you know, this isn't what they were hired to do, but now they're taking on all these additional responsibilities. Well, I think one thing, Coach, I know your internship program is great. I've seen how you, you organize it. One thing that I think coaches we tend to do, especially if we're doing our job well, we don't we don't self promote. Most coaches don't. You know, there are some that do, and they tend to move up a little quicker sometimes. But when you don't self promote it kind of goes against the grain of your core values to say, hey, look at what we're doing. So what I found out was we go in, we start going over an internship program, and we it's pretty cool because they're going to institute a department-wide internship policy, and they're going to base it off what Sandy and myself have been doing down in our weight room. And so sometimes, Coach, I don't know if everybody knows what a great job you're doing. They don't know the hours and the stress and the, the time that you're pouring into young coaches that's helping those student-athletes. And it's also building a university right. as well, so they don't see it. I, so I think you got to do more to bring that to light with your administrators on, on what exactly you're doing, and because uh, people just take it for granted, right? So I have, because you just do it so effortlessly and so so great that people they don't see it and they just take it for granted. No, I think you're I think you're absolutely right, and, and there's definitely a way to self promote without being a, a douchebag. You, you can you definitely can. You know, put yourself and your department in a positive light, and as a leader of a department, you have a responsibility to do that. You know, and I and I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and one thing too, Coach, I'll add to because of what you do yeah. with, with this Iron Game Chalk Talk. One thing I started doing is I started getting involved in other departments and getting to know some of those leaders. And so we started sharing ideas, and and they pick up some of the good ideas you're using. And so that helps you. That's one way you can kind of promote your department without getting out and kind of That's causing right. a stink or saying, look at me, is that other people are singing your praises versus yourself. It's huge. Agreed. Uh, I agree 100% with that. You know, with with having, uh, you know, passionate, motivated coaches, you know, um, those those coaches are hungry. They they're, they're hungry for knowledge. That's what that's one of the unique things about strength and conditioning coaches is that they never are satisfied. Um, yes. With that comes the continual education piece, and I know you guys do a great job of sitting down with your staff and and, and and you know what's that process? You know how do you kind of organize continual education? And then I know you know you, you you've done a clinic on campus. You you, you brought some people in from an, for an in service standpoint. You know, what are, what are, you know, how are you managing that and making sure that you're getting that time in? Well, I want to give you a little bit more information, kind of how it's kind of tra transformed over the years. Yeah. I would say before I, before I give you all this is I would say start really small. Don't try to go and create this huge bang for your buck and impress everybody. Just start small. And how I started was I started 
contacting professors in our Kines department. And every summer I would call it, I call it our summer lecture series. And once a week, I would, for, for the eight weeks, I'd bring in a different professor or coach in our department where I didn't have, I didn't have the funds for it at the time. We didn't have any resources. And we would video and create manuals for interns to take with them as they go. And so that's kind of how we started. It transpired into, as we moved into our new weight room now, I knew a big part of, of us being successful would be growth and education as coaches, as you talk about as well. So we came up with the title, it's called TAPES, Texas Athletic Performance Education Series. And the way we do it, we do it, it's very simple, we do once a month, and we try to use our resources that we have there at Texas, and we brought in, I know we brought in Ty Seven recently, who's worked at the Olympic Training Center. He's done several sessions with us already that were amazing. Recently, we brought in Cal Dietz. Uh, we, we had the resources to bring him in. He was in, he just left this morning. Actually, we had him in for a couple of days. But just make, really making that a priority and a core value of your staff and your department is huge. And that's kind of how it's transpired. And then it turned into, for the past few years, I've had this vision for doing a athletic performance clinic. Right. And you've done that for, for years, Coach. I've never done one. It was a ton of work, but it was well, well, well worth the effort to Absolutely. get those coaches in here to speak and learn from them. Well, in, the, in that setting, what it end up, ends up happening is not only are you uh, getting the advantage of hearing them speak on the topic that they're presenting, but you, you're getting around. You get to clinic with them for the whole weekend and, and, and really get to nitpick and uh, have them take a look at your program and contribute, and and by having and hosting a clinic, you're you're bringing in the people that you want to learn from. Uh, and, yeah, uh, it's fantastic, fantastic deal. And I know you guys do a great job. You know, one of the things that we're we're working on here actually is is um, with our you know our, our physical education department, our kinesis department, coming in and and once a month going through the the research journal, the NSCA journal, and and really you know diving into each one of those. Um, research studies and explaining the practical application for us, you know, because I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we all had our exercise science degrees, we all, you know, all those types of things, but you know, we're not spending twenty four hours a day looking at the research and yes, sir, um, and, have and, and having somebody to come come in and, and basically, you know, show us where the flaws are a lot of times in the research because you know as well as I do that for every research study, there's a, there's one that contradicts it a lot of times, you know, and so really kind of being able to form your own opinion. But I think that's uh, you know it's, it's obviously um, you and I share the same opinion on on really investing in your in your staff members and and by doing that uh, your return on investment is huge. That's right, Coach. I know uh, somebody told me one time gave me a piece of advice. I remember I sat down. It was a friend of mine. We were having lunch, and she told me she says, "Look, don't get don't leave Texas one day and look back and go." I wish I would have taken advantage of this resource. I wish I would have spent more time with this person. So it really made me forced to look at our resources that we have there on campus and start utilizing those, and it made a big difference. Yeah, no, that's a great point, great point. Well, I know, you know, I, I sat in on your presentation. I missed, I was, I was upset that I missed the entrance. You know, everybody's <laughs> been talking about the entrance. Um, but um, but I sat in on your presentation, and uh you know, talking you know specifically about your internship program, and you know, talk about the evolution of that because I know it was you know it's always been kind of a piece, but you guys have really made a big commitment to making it a major piece of what you got going on moving forward. Um, talk about that that growth, Coach. It's it's crazy the internship program. I took it over just it kind of fell in my lap in 2007 in the summer, and. I had talked to Coach Madden about, hey, can, would, would it be okay if we, people want to come and help us this summer? He goes, well, sure, just, you know, you interview them, you, you talk to them, and, and you bring them in. So I brought in six that year. And really, Coach, my only criteria for bringing them in was like, do you want to come? <laughs> I thought I said, Coach. <laughs> and, uh, which is not the right question, by no, the way. You're right. And so I learned a lot. I, made, I have made so many mistakes with working with interns and so from 2007 till we moved into this new weight room, I pretty much oversaw our internship program. And the one thing that really made it tough was when they came out with the rule that you can only have five strength coaches with yep. football, that really, that was hard to deal with because now instead of bringing in coaches you could develop, you really could only bring in coaches 
that could really wipe down, clean up, and stretch guys and couldn't do anything in the weight room, which was tough. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, that was a huge obviously obstacle, and they're working on trying to get that changed. But, um, but I think, you know, the internship program over the years, I think number one, Coach, is knowing how to interview people. I didn't realize that interviewing people is like an actual skill that you learn as a leader. Mm -hmm. And I was horrible at it at first, like terrible. And I've gotten better at it over the years, but it's knowing how to ask the right questions, how to follow up with different – everybody's going to put references on their sheet that, hey, he's the most awesome coach on the planet. But knowing how to get to the, the answers you're looking for from that person – and bringing somebody that really that's not just a great coach, but they fit your staff. Yeah, that's the key thing is that it fits the culture, the core values, and the the inter to personal interpersonal dynamics of your staff is huge. So that's what took the longest time to kind of figure some of that out. Mm -hmm. And the recently Sandy Coach Sandy Abney has taken it over. She's taken what I've built to a whole nother level. Now she's taking everything online. She's getting more involved in Olympic sports. They can coach. Right. So we're getting them more involved with different teams. They're writing articles, having roundtable discussions. They're uh, setting up interviews with the, with our strength staff and learning from them and doing some mentoring there. So she's taking it to a whole other level that I never did. So, Well, you, you know, you touched on, you know, obviously the, the importance. I think the importance of it, uh, especially the strength coaches that are listening to this that have the opportunity to run internship programs or being an assistant have the opportunity to be able to go and say, hey, can we do this? I can tell you from first experience, I mean, we got 11 interns here at Eastern Michigan for the summer. and, and That's great. And, and, you know, it's Eastern Michigan. It's in the middle of you know, nowhere. But it's, you know, there's, there's a, a surplus of coaches that want to learn um, and want to, to continue to develop. And, and uh, as long as you invest in them, um, you know, they'll run through a brick wall for you, whatever that is. You know, if that's working, you know, with 10 teams, it's working with 10 teams, but they'll do it. You know, we uh, we just had we just had a, a meeting this morning. We had an extra lift this morning, and, and had some of the guys in. And we we were we had a, a strength coach who had interned for a former intern of mine, okay. um, and come in and talk to the group. And it's 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 so rewarding as a coach to to know that you've had an impact on not even a first generation, but a second or third generation um, coach that's doing great things in the profession and. Um, you know, but it is, you're, you're absolutely right when you say that it is a lot of work and, um, you gotta, you gotta have, um, a great team around you and put together a good plan. And I know you guys have down there. I think too, one, one thought on that is when, as you were talking, I always think of the word legacy. And I think the best coaches, if you look at them, whether it's a, um, like a guy like Bill McCartney at one time when I was, when we worked at Colorado, he had four or five head coaches that he had put in different places. And so you look at the, some of the better strength coaches, they're not just all about themselves. They're right. about taking younger coaches, training them up, and sending them out and helping them be hopefully more successful than they were because they've helped them grow faster. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always say, you know, good leaders lead others, but great leaders lead leaders. Yeah. And it's a whole different level when you start becoming a leader of leaders, and that's kind of what you're talking about. No, you're absolutely right. You know, I went, so I'm – you know, I'm a head strength coach at 23 years old, and I'm, I'm looking around. I'm like, all right, now how am I gonna how am I gonna stay in this profession? You know, and that's you know, it took a little foresight. I'm I'm kind of impressed with myself back in my 23 year old self, and saying what you know really sat back. I had a conversation um, with myself saying what what do I need to do to be one of the greats? And, and so I looked around and I looked at you know all the all the strength coaches you know um, of the time that were having success and what were they doing and, and you know. One thing that stood out to me was they all worked extremely hard where they're at, and they weren't looking for the next opportunity. That's they didn't right. Think about it. Second thing is that they, you know, that they wrote and spoke. You know, and they, they got out and they were active um, as far as contributing back to the profession. And then third thing is exactly what you're saying, where they they developed coaches. They had a coaching tree um, that they were able to. And, and what's what's great about it, and you've done it, and I've done it, um, is it's it's you know what's amazing about that is that it's you, you think that you're you're doing all this investment for for them, but I'm telling you right now now so many intern classes that I've had that have come through every semester I'm getting manuals and videos and book recommendations and and all this information back from coaches that have been through my program that have gone and made it better you know 
And uh, I, I tell you, I've been, I'm, I'm the beneficiary. Yeah, and that, you know what, though, Coach, you you have a great point because you do do a, an awesome job with your interns. But I remember one time somebody said, if it, if you're lonely at the top as a leader, that's your fault. And I think part of being the internship program is that you're helping. You you got these relationships now all across the country that you can call or that know somebody that can speak about your character and your leadership as a coach and how you've impacted other people's lives, which makes your job even that more more fulfilling, in my opinion. Sure, sure. You know, the, um, this field, is so, it, it's a demanding field. You've been in it for a long time. You know, I know you've got a wife. You've got four daughters at home. You yes, know, <laughs> And, um, you know, you've been able to balance that. And, and you know, shoot, you've been, what was it? What, what, what late night show were you on? Oh, Jimmy Kimmel? Yeah. So you've been on Jimmy Kimmel. you got, you know, you got a great family. You know, you, you, you've done some really, really cool things outside of, you know, you've written a book. You yeah. know, uh Talk a little bit about maintaining balance and doing this job. Well, I, I want to share a quick story Coach Center, our tennis coach, shared with me one day. And this kind of it kind of gives you a quick visual. But he he said his wife came into him one day, Coach, and she just threw this little newspaper article down on his desk. And it was basically it was simple. It was an article talking about all of us as coaches, our people, we have five balls in our life that we carry. We all carry five balls. One of them is... You know, one of them is your friends, one of them is your hobbies, one of them is your work, uh, one of them is your finances, and then one of them is your family. And the article is simple. It talked about four of those balls are rubber, one of those balls is glass. And so the glass ball is your family. If you drop the glass ball, it breaks. But if you drop the other ones, you can get more friends, you can get another job, you can find a new hobby if you couldn't do it. But if you drop that glass ball... It breaks and you don't get it back. When I was working with Doc Crease, I watched him go through a very hard divorce between him and his wife. And if you talk to Doc today, that that changed because he was a you know eighty hour a week type of guy and was rarely home. I lived with him for a month and kind of got to see it. And as coaches, we really, if we're not careful, we can kind of misplace our priorities. Now, there's going to be seasons. Where you're way out, you know, there's coaches, we don't live balanced lives. You know this. Right. That word doesn't exist. But what can happen, what will make it work, when say if you're spending a whole football season where you're on the road and all that, you're not being home much. Well, when you get those time periods where you can get home, shut it down and get home and balance it the other way, swing it out of balance the other way to help make up for some of that. And that's kind of how it's it's worked for me over the years. Mm. No, I, you know, I've said that a lot. You know, coaches' kids, you know, they're, they're, they're special kids. You know, they get the opportunities to be and interact and see a lot of things that other kids don't get to, to do. Um, so there's definitely a positive to it, but there's always a, there, there is a negative to not being able to see their dad as much or their, their, their mom as much. And, you, you know, I've said that throughout my career, that the most important thing is that when you are at home, that it, 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 is, it is quality time. Yes, and sir. And it's memorable time. You know, and yeah. uh, you know, and so we try to we try to make memories when when you have that because it is it's delicate, like you say, and that, that's a great analogy. I love that. I'm gonna use that. And I think too, the other piece to it that's huge is is your relationship as a coach with your wife. Yeah. And you gotta. I mean, it takes a special woman to be married to a coach. I mean, mm-hmm. a coach's wife. She's a. I mean, she's got to be able to manage a lot of stuff because you're not there a lot. And my wife, Karen, is. She's been a rock star over the years. I remember one time, Coach, we got through the football season, and she told me one time, she said, I, I feel like a single parent. And I never knew that. You know, that, that kind of that hurt to hear that, but it was good for me to realize that, hey, there's time she does want to spend time with me. And so I think as a coach, is you've got you've to gotta make that a priority in your family. That's got to be something that – and there's different ways to do that, I think. You can get them involved at your work. I know I used to, when the kids were little, I'd come up, have them come up. We'd all have lunch together. So there's yeah. different ways of getting them involved in your work that you can create that time. It will make a difference over the long haul. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Well, Coach, I know you got to get going, but, you know, we always kind of end these things with, you know, some motivational quotes and some recommendations and things like that. And, and uh, I know that, you know, you and I share that, you know, as far as wanting to uh, constantly reading and constantly grabbing quotes and, 
you know, I, as soon as you did the, uh, the Yoda clip in your presentation, I went and I downloaded <laughs> that and made, I made that a part of things that I'll use. But give us, give us a motivational quote that you use or that you, you, you know, that you either have your, what plastered in your weight room or, or something that you live by. Probably one of my biggest quotes I live by is by John C. Maxwell. Mm-hmm. And it, it's simple. And I know you know it, but it's people don't care how much you know until they know how much you really care. Absolutely. And I think when, and we, we live in such a, the world we live in is so volatile as far as the pressure and the hours. We really got to stop as coaches and really let people know we care about them and appreciate what they're doing. I, I think I'm a huge on handwritten notes. It takes two minutes to write a handwritten note, send it to them, and coach. People keep those for years. Oh, yeah. But when you, I remember reading one time that people don't quit because uh, they don't, they get burned out on their job. They quit because they're, they feel underappreciated. So that quote is huge for me in everything I do. Absolutely. Well, I know, you know, John, John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is my favorite, favorite leadership book. And I know you, you said the law of attraction earlier, but give us, give us a book recommendation, something that you, maybe you've read recently or, or that you think every strength coach should read. Well, I know I'm definitely, we just got through reading Cal's book, Cal Dietz's book for strength training, the triphasic, you know it well. That's a phenomenal, simple book. That's a great book. I think for, I always think the way I kind of do my, first of all, half price books is like my, that's my sanctuary. I don't know if you ever heard of, I can go in there and just spend hours and look at books and I'll come home with like 10 books and my wife just shakes her head. I got more books climbing the wall, coach. Where is this at? Half price books. I've never heard of it. What, it's a, it's a, a store yeah. or is it an online thing? No, it's a bookstore and you go in there and everything's like six to eight bucks or less. Wow. And that's, I'll find that's brand new. right there. Coach, I mean, if you like to read, I suggest anybody likes to read half price books. <laughs> you got one near you. I've got four or five of them in town. I wrote, I've got them on the calendar rotation. <laughs> people, what it is, people bring in their old books and sell them. And so about every two weeks, they'll have a, a fresh stockpile of books. Yeah. And you get books in there for one and two dollars cheaper than Amazon. Yeah. So I recommend half price books. Uh, another book that I read recently by Henry Cloud. It's called Boundaries for Leaders. Phenomenal book on just changing the culture of your work environment. And I I devoured it. You, you'll eat it up in about two or three days if you're a big reader. Yeah, no, that's awesome. It's awesome. What about from a from a strength and conditioning standpoint, or just a, or maybe a, a time efficiency standpoint? So, you know, at an app and or, or website recommendation. Yes, this is if you. This this app, I, I thought about this one. There's there's a ton out there, but I'm big into personal growth, just like you. This is a John C. Maxwell app. It's called Lead Now, and it's actually it's it, it costs to be a member of that to get all the content. But once a month, Coach, I get a downloaded pod like a leadership lesson from John that's current and relevant. Like last month's leadership lesson was. 13 mistakes that mentally weak people do, which, man, that applies to yeah. not only me as a husband, but my coaching career. And so all the lessons are applicable across coaching, administration, and in my home life. And I think it's about $220 a year, but you get you get the, the audio content, you get videos on there from him, interviews from different people, you'll get articles and all kind of connections like that. So Lead Now is a phenomenal uh, app that you would not be disappointed if you checked it out for at least a year. You would love it. I'm definitely going to check that out. I didn't know that one. What about any, any websites that you, you go to regularly? Um, let me see. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I check yours out pretty frequently. I love, you know, I know that everybody that listens to you pretty much loves you, but I love coming to yours and just seeing kind of what you're saying. Yours is awesome. I'll check uh, lead FTS pretty frequently as far as strength. Um, what's the other one? Those are pretty the main ones for me personally. Oh, that's great. I check it, and like I said, I'm always I'm always on Amazon. If you look at my my browser, I'm always looking for books on Amazon and sales and and trying to get more more uh, knowledge and information. Oh, I'm with you. That, that's fantastic. Well, Coach, I, I know you're a busy man. I know you took a Saturday out and talked to us and. One of the all-time greats, man. I appreciate your, what you do for the profession. I appreciate what you do 
there with your athletes and then uh, obviously coming on the show with us. So thanks so much, man. Thank you, Coach Mack. I appreciate you. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.